Okay, now, what you can do, and I'm not, I just love pulling the plugs because usually the fishing's more, is, is better. But, you can pull, when I was talking spinners, this is what I'm talking about, something like this. Now, if you put this guy out there, you're going to have to have a diver on it because it's going to sit on the surface and spin. What can happen, <clears throat> just how fish go through their aggression phase, all this rattling, shaking, and rolling, blah, 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 okay, when they're moving through and they're aggressive, maybe if you're sitting in a hole and the fish aren't moving much when the water's low and clear, maybe it's only flowing at 30,000 and it hasn't muddied up yet, this may be a little too much. Maybe a little too much. All that's happening is that as they move through, guys, this thing is sitting in their face and they don't want to move away from it. They just run right into it. But if it's too much, too much rattle flash, too much scent, it can push them away. So if you find that this is not producing and you're seeing fish rolling and you're going, okay, I know they're, you see them on your graph going, you'll see them on the graph go through. There goes the school right underneath you. You'll see them rolling. If you're seeing that and you're not catching anything, Go to a spinner setup. These just, I got these at the Rogue River when I was down there on the coast. It's just a spinner. You, you find them in any sportsman's warehouse, whatever. What color is it? Well, it's green and chartreuse. Okay. What you do with this, guys, jet diver. You all familiar with the jet diver? Hook this guy in your line. I put all mine on sliders. I don't hook them directly into the line. I put them on sliders. So I've got the slider up above. I got a dropper of, you know, 18 to 24 inches. With this, I want to go a little bit more because the spoon's going to want to sink. So I may go down, you know, 24, 28 inches with this. Set this in the water. The bill hooks, takes it down. So now this thing's down in there working around like this. And this is up above, off the back end of the swivel, up here off the bottom, you know, 18 inches. What we do with these, same thing. Egg sack or a tuna ball. Tuna balls work great. Tie that same tuna sack, come in, just clip it here so it's hanging on the back. Now the spinning, because maybe the water's not so clear, not moving so fast, just the spinning in this vibration, it's very subtle. They swim up to it and they just grab it. What you'll find with these strikes is these strikes will not be quite as violent as this, the plugs. This will be one of those tappity tap tap deals and just wait for it to load up. So if you ever get down there, once again, you're not getting the fish. Maybe you ran this, fast water, or moderate water, nothing. My next step would be to go to this. This is smaller, not quite as erratic. If this doesn't produce, then I go to spinner. I say, okay, it's spinner time. Something subtle. Still got the tuna back there. The other alternative to that is just a spinning glow. Take a spinning glow like this. Thread it on, do your snell knot. You could put a bead or two in here if you wanted. I usually put one bead that just helps this spin. Six millimeter bead acts like a bearing. Then I tie my snell knot, okay? What this does comes down, it's now spinning. I have that one odd or two odd hook on there with a tuna ball on it. So I've got the scent coming. What this is over this, this is a lot more subtle yet. This thing spins through the water, creates just a little bit of vibration. It's not got the big thump that this blade has. This is for very, very tough conditions, okay? When they're not biting, but you're seeing fish, the water's not flowing hard. And typically, the harder the flow of water, the better the fishing is. Reason being is it's pushing more water, they're moving. They wanna move when the water's high. So you've got more fish coming across. So you may be sitting in a hole with this where it's moving, and there's actually salmon just kind of sitting there. That's what you're using this for. This is subtle fishing right here. Same thing off of your rig. So I'll, just so you guys see that, what I'm talking about. You've got a swivel here, okay? Then up here you've got, a, uh, I put a bead on just to protect my knot. And then you've got your sleeve that has a hook on it like this. This leader's coming down like this and hooking into your jet diver. Now this is coming back three, four, five feet. Don't get past the length of your rod. Don't go eight feet, because you won't be able to land a fish. Okay? Five, six feet back, and you've got your, you know, spinning glow back here with your egg and your tuna sack, or your spinner, inline spinner. That's the setup. So now this thing is just down there, and you want this jet diver to be down there hitting in the bottom. 
Okay, and this spinner is just sitting back here. The alternative to this, and this is only in conditions where it's even slower and tougher, is back bouncing. You guys heard of back bouncing? Okay, you're anchored up. Or you can back troll do this. You can back troll doing this. And all these techniques, guys, if it's, if it's slow and the water's clear, you may not be anchoring up. You may be needing to back up into the fish. At 50K, you ain't backing up. Okay, you're anchored up in a seam somewhere. So when water, water conditions are low, you can back troll this. Everybody familiar with back trolling? You know what that means? Current's coming this way. The boat's pointed this way like this and we're letting the boat slide backwards slowly as we got our plugs going. You'll see this technique early part in the year because you're trying to back into the fish because they may not be moving as fast because the water ain't moving as hard. So don't be afraid to back troll those if it's slow water conditions. Now back bouncing, you can do what it is, is you've got your dropper weight here going up to a three-way swivel rig here main line here. Off the back of this is your spinner. It's your spinning glow, whatever. And you lift it up. And when you lift it off the bottom, it's going to drift. Then you let some line out till it hits. Then you let it sit. Then you lift it up, let some line out till it hits. If you're back trolling and the boat's pointed this way and I'm steering going down the river this way, I'm lifting it up as the boat slides back and putting it back down. Bonk, bonk. What you're doing is trying to work this presentation into a fish that's just sitting there. This distance here depends. The water's flowing faster, not at 50K, but it's flowing fast enough to where you can manage to back troll like that. If it's quicker, you go shorter. If it's really slow, you go further up because remember, they won't be hugging down to the bottom. And you're just going plunk, let's line up plunk, let's line up plunk. Once you get a ways out there, you reel it in, you start the process all over again. Because when it comes at them, they don't want to move. They're not eating, guys. As soon as they enter fresh water, their esophagus closes shut. And they're no longer eating. It's just all out of aggression. That's it. So you have to do something to make them mad. So back in a bait into their face, they may back up a little bit, and back up a little bit, and then finally I'm tired of this, and bang. All right? So back bouncing, that's all it is. You can run eggs, you can run tuna ball, you can run a prawn and egg combination. Whatever bait you want. Don't just say, oh, I'm just going to go out and do this. Have some eggs, have some prawns, have some tuna. If you've got a bunch of guys fishing tuna and you go out there with eggs, you're probably going to catch more fish. They've been accustomed to that smell, you go out there, boom. You know, the, the, the Brad super baits, packing them with tuna. It's great. We also throw a strip of herring in there, a strip of anchovy in there. Whatever, just to change it up. You've got to be different sometimes when you're in a crowd. Now, I want to talk about something. And this, is, this, this goes into the line of keeping them, and we're going to do questions and answers on this. But I see this happen, guys, down there when people keep the salmon. And this goes for any fish. Because I'll go down there and harvest some salmon because I like them. I rarely harvest fish, but I like to harvest some salmon. When guys catch the salmon... Well, I know I'm supposed to bleed it, so you cut the gills, you cut the base of the tail, whatever. And I see this happen down there. I see it steelhead, and I see it down at Vernita. I see it all the time. These guys do that and bleed it because you want to get the blood out of there so it doesn't leach back into the flesh and, and spoil it. Then they just drag them around on a stringer. Okay, well, set the water's, the water's cool. Well, yeah, it is cold. This is what happens. When you go to a fish market, those fish will be packed on ice, but they're sitting on a grate or they're sitting on a table. You go into the Albertsons or whatever, they're on a table, right? That's so the water runs away. You do not want your freshly caught fish to sit in a cooler full of water or to sit on a stringer. It's going to make it mushy. It's going to break the meat down. Trust me on this. Pack them in ice, bleed them out, get them up above the water. Okay? I just I see that down there. Just It's a shame because it... The fish will taste so much better if you just do that. I promise. Trout, I don't care what it is. Now, if you don't have, you guys all have a jet boat? Nobody has a jet boat. So you're all going to be fishing down around the confluence, right? Below the mill and all that? Or Ringgold. Or Ringgold, yep. 
Okay, for, for the, the clear water guys, no Ringgold guys, this applies to because there's holes down there. Do you hit amber too? You know, springtime, all my springtime stuff I do on the clear water. And then I do it on the salmon. That's where I spend most of my... Now, the summer fish, which go up into Brewster, I, Wells Dam and all that, I love fishing that. Mouth of the Okanagan. But that fishery there is flashers, Brad super baits, wiggle warts, you know, helmeted herring. It's that type. The springtime fish, they're more just plug-oriented. Okay? If you go down to Lewiston, if you don't have a jet boat, you're going to basically be fishing from the pulp mill down towards where it's closed at, which would be out towards the snake. You know those big gates when you guys go down there steelhead fishing? You know, down when you go down there below the pulp mill, or what is that place called, Dad? What is the mill down there, the big mill? Paper. Yeah, the paper mill, what is that? It's a... Potlatch. Potlatch, jeez, wow, dude. <laughs> Took me a yeah, well you know, potlatch sits up here. And then it, it kind of rakes a turn. It's, it's pretty shallow and rapid through here. Well, when you come down through, when you're going down through, you always see people walking right here and stuff. You'll see these gates, and you'll see guys fishing out off of them. Well, those are water exchange gates. They're taking water in or letting water out from cooling or from the ponds or whatever it is. Well, where you come up to every one of those, it'll be shallow, and then below it is a depression. And then it gets shallow again. If you're going to go down there and do that, you want to key in on these areas because those fish will come in and lay in those depressions. So we'll set up, and we did a steelhead, and Dad and I pulling plugs. You come in, it's just a slight depth change, and in the spring it's going to be a lot higher because the water's obviously higher. But what it is, is you'll set your plugs right in here, and your boat will be up here if you can get the available spot. And these fish come in and rest in here, and then they pull out. Well, you got all this other river. Now, there's fish out there. But you're trying to condense it down, that 90%. The odds in your favor. Anywhere where you see those gates like that, there'll be a hole that it'll come up. And those fish will stack in that hole, rest. You want your plugs right at the top of it. When they come out, they run into them. The other place that's good, we catch a ton of steelhead off of these. You know the bridge there, Memorial Bridge? Right, where you go into Clarkston? Okay. If you like to steal it down there, it's a trick for you too. You got your bridge pilings like this. Now, Dad and I, when we're down there steelhead, and if we're bobber fishing, we throw our bobber right in here, and the current's coming this way, and we just let the bobber just roll right down the face of this. Because what's happening as the current comes down, what is this doing right here? What is that doing? Current break, correct? It's making an eddy right there like this. Well, they suck right up against that wall and they'll hold there. You can come up in here, anchor up above, run your plug down right along the face of that. And those salmon will go right in there just like the steelhead will. They got a nose for a current break. Whatever's easiest. Path of least resistance. All of these. Now there's one in there that's got about 20 of my jigs on it and dad's. It's got a big tree on it that blew in there. So if you break off on that one, I apologize. But don't be afraid to run those plugs right along the face of those when those fish are coming through there because they're going to go right up in there and mill around and your plug's going to be sitting right there in your face when they come out. Can I ask you how big your anchor is in your boat? You know, the anchor, that's a good question. Guys, I got a 20 foot and it's just a, it's a crest liner, it's a sled. What it is, it's an all welded John boat, utility boat, just a big 8 foot by 20 foot with a 115 on it. So I don't have a ton of drag. But the key with the anchor is this. I think they call them Danforth anchors, but I don't know. If you look at my anchor, guys, it looks like this. Go to Sportsman's Warehouse and you'll see this. It's like this, and it's like this. And there's four of these. Okay? Then there's a hook right here, and then there's the top hook right here. And what you'll see is I got a chain running all the way up this, and you want to use the extra amount of chain, guys, because you got to get double what you're down. So if it's 10, 10 feet, you want to be 20, 30 feet of rope to get it to stick. That's why people have a hard time anchoring. Not the right anchor, and they don't do the right thing. If I drop down like this and drop my anchor, what is that boat doing? It's lifting it up. If I get out here and I take this angle, and if I had paid attention in algebra trig or geometry, 
it would make more sense. But you increase this angle, which lays that anchor over and allows it to hook. That's the biggest problem that guys have. We run way up in front of our spot. Throw the anchor out and just start feeding it. And if we went up too far, who cares? Just keep letting line out until we get there. Now this anchor here is not that heavy, guys. Maybe, what would you say, Dad? 25 pounds? Maybe 30 pounds? Okay. Somewhere in that neighborhood. Maybe not even that much. But what it does, see these forks on it? When you get the angle right, these get stuck under rocks. And they grab extremely well. Now I've got an anchor system on my boat. The big buoy with the one-way rope so that when I let it out, it feeds out. Then when I, I keep holding the buoy, okay, it's hooked up, I grab my dog clip, I clip it to my bow, and I throw the buoy out. Now the buoy's just sitting there. You guys have seen those before, right? Whatever I've got left in my lead, I wrap it up really nice, you know, little white bumpers for your boat. I tie a loop around that so it's just pinched off. If I hook a big fish and we need to leave, all I gotta do is fire the boat up, move forward, the guy in front on clips takes that extra rope, with that bumper and throws it out. And then we're free. We land the fish. We come back up, guy in the bow reaches over, grabs the slack, I pull forward so he can hook it, hooks it, and then back we go. The nice thing about those is this. It's a one-way rope, so the rope slides through. Okay? When I go to pull up, when you're letting it out, you have to disengage it so the rope slides. So you're holding it in your hand, just feeding it out. It's got a little slider like this that locks down on the rope. When you're done, all I do is just haul butt right up river. Ah, and I'm dragging that buoy. Well, now that thing disengages and the line's coming like this, pulling through. Ah, and I go up, and as soon as I see that, that buoy go boom like that, then I let off and we start floating down river. And all you're doing is just taking, I use a five gallon pail. I'm peeling my rope into my pail. This is the not dying part. Peeling my rope off into my pail, okay? What that does is it doesn't get all knotted up, comes right out of the pail nice. Pull it in and that anchor is floating right underneath that buoy now. You will never go pulling the anchor in again. The buoy pulls it up. If you got the money, get it. Because the buoy pull, it is the slickest thing in the world. You're not sitting there doing anything. Your boat just floats right over to it. You get there, you grab your chain, you put it in the boat. Getting back to the bucket, the guys that drown down there is this. How many times you get out there and you throw the ink? Oh man, it's all knotted up. You're fighting with it and whatever. Before you go out, serious. I, you know, cat litter, like you get the cat litter, those pails, perfect, whatever, who cares. Pull it all out, get it all nice and laid out and just start feeding it in there. And it just coils all up, okay? Get it right up tight and I got the buoy on there and I got a little dog leash. It's a big heavy one, but a clip. One end of it's got a swivel on it. It's not on the line. I throw it out. It's going and going and going. We hook up. Yeah, it's hooked up. Guys pull forward. So my boatman drives me forward a little bit. I just take that and double that line over, the down or the, the rope, double it over, push it through the swivel part, and just flip it around. It's not a knot. It's just flipped around so it's locked in there. Clip it to the bow. What happens with those guys is this. They get all that rope around their feet, and this is what happened. The one guy all they ended up finding was his final shirt. And I still don't know if they ever found him. They throw the anchor out. It's dangerous because the water is moving fast. Always have a knife handy. I don't care if it's on you or what. You always have a knife handy. Threw it out, and this is how the three guys went out. Threw it out. Oh, shit, it's around my leg. Hooked around the leg. Boat's going back. The water's moving. Right on out. And then you're matched up with the anchor rope, and you basically drowned you. Okay, the bucket will save your butt because it's not wrapped around your feet. The other thing that happens is this, a buddy of mine, John, he's got a little 14 foot boat. He probably goes down there when he shouldn't. Last year, a windstorm came up, up the Salmon River. He had his anchor. It blew his boat upstream. He got over in the eddy because we're fishing eddies, which is slack and the eddy does what? Goes back up against the current, right against the shoreline. He got hooked in the eddy, it swung the boat, and he's trying to get his lines cleared. The boat swung around, tied into his anchor rope, went across the, the prop. Now all of a sudden you got a 14 foot crankbait. Because that coming from the back, it's not sliding no more. So that water's pushing against that flat surface and it does this. He started taking water over the back, he's always got his rope. 
cut his rope. It'll sink you like that. I've seen guys go up there and throw an anchor out the back. You never, ever anchor the back of your boat. Never. Because if something happens to the front and it swings, you're done. Down where we fish on Oxbow, a guy had that happen. A buddy of mine was down there. He saved them, but they lost the boat. Had an anchor out the front and an anchor out the back, and it swung around. There's no reason in the current to anchor the back. If that boat's shimmying around a little bit, who cares? Fine. Well, the front let go, the back hook spun around, the boat went like 17-footer. Pulled it right down. Gone. Okay? Don't do it. So always have your knife handy. Now, <laughs> yeah, the tie straps on this. Yeah, let me show you that, guys. This is a great anchor to go by. Let me show you that good thing. Good call there, Dad. What this has, guys, is this. This is the center stem, then it runs up like this. Remember I told you I had the hook here and the hook here with chain? All right, this is going to save you money in the anchoring. If you look at this, there's four or five, could be six, depending on how fast the water is, zip ties here, right up here. Now, if you know how anchors will get stuck? If you take off and this anchor gets stuck, you're trying to pull it out of those rocks where it's hooked in, because it's laying, the, the bottom's like this, and it's hooked into a rock here and here. So you're trying to pull it up this way. Well, you drive forward, you're trying to, what? You're trying to get leverage on it to pop it up. What this anchor has, like I said, go to Sportsman's Warehouse and you'll see it. What this anchor has is these zip ties. You zip tie your chain up here. You get going and you can't get it to go, you just keep going and it breaks those zip ties, boom. Now it's pulling from here. Digs it right out of the rocks. It works like a champ. It works like a champ. The best anchor I've ever used. You won't lose it. You bust it off at the bottom, and now it's going to pull it right back out of those rocks as you drive forward. So you'll save a lot of money in it. Yeah, that's a good anchor right there. It's all black, coated with rubber. What time we got, Dad? We're at 420 right now, so you're there. Yep. All right, guys, what we'll do is we'll do some questions. Okay. Fire me off some questions. Anybody? Come on. Questions. Ringle. Depending upon the, the year, for us in the Salmon River and in the Clearwater Rivers, typically what we bank it off of is about the oh middle of, middle of May till Father's Day. That's usually, and right around Father's Day is usually your best. Now the problem with that is, is if there's a bunch of fish coming through and they meet their quota fast, they shut it down. But the middle of May, what usually happens then, there's fish in there before then, guys, but usually what happens is everything blows up into April and May. Two, three weeks, it's blown up. I mean, that salmon was running up to like 100,000. I mean, it's just scary to look at it. It's, it's just, you just go, wow. <laughs> you know, but it blows up and the fish are coming, but you can't get to them. But usually that period from, you know, May 15th or whatever to Father's Day is going to be your best time to do it. Now, what's cool about this year, and we'll see how true it is, they predict what's coming this year based off of the jack count from last year. Now the jack count last year was through the roof. Jacks are the little small guys. You know, they've only been out in the salt for a year. They're two, three pounds. I mean, they're pfft. Okay? Those fish there, they returned in a high number, which the predictions are, they're saying 200,000 plus. If that happens, you you got to go do it because it is simple salmon fishing. It's not like down summer fishing in Ringgold. Now that ain't simple. This is simple. There's a lot more room for air in the spring. But the numbers will be through the roof, and they're saying there could be some four salt fish, which that tells you 30 to 40 pound fish. Typically, your springer fish, don't be depressed if you're just catching 10, 12 pounders. That's a normal thing. Springer fish are not as big as the fall fish. The springer fish are more desirable to eat because they come in with a higher fat content. They haven't used their reserves up like the summer fish have, battling through all that hot water. Okay. Other questions? Come on, guys. More questions. Anybody? Okay. Nobody. Do you, you go down and fish that Brewster area? Or you mainly fish Ringgold in the fall. Ringgold. Ringgold in the fall. Yeah, one guys, I'll tell you right now. If you like to catch salmon, I, I encourage you to go do this. July first, it opens down at Brewster. Okay, and Brewster is just between you know where Chief Joe, Joe Dam is at. Well, that's the pool below that. That's Lake Pateras. About July 15th, 
head down there. There's some good hotels in the Lake Pateras Motor Inn. We've stayed there, nice place. Don's a great guy. Go down there and fish for those fish, okay? Basically, those are like, they're, they call them a summer run because they come in just a little bit later and you're fishing for them in the summer. Now, you can go catch those springers that we're talking about all the way up to the Little Salmon in July if it's still open. That just depends on the season. But the Brewster fish, they're big fish. They're high fat content. You're 25, 30 pounds, not uncommon. Every now and then they poke a 40 out of there. You use a lot more of a spinning process. Okay, it's, it's uh, early part of the season, it's, it's cut plug herring or helmeted herring behind a big flasher. Uh, super baits, Brad super baits work good. As those fish come in and what they're doing, those fish that are coming up through wells and that, Rock Island wells on up, is that they're going up the Okanagan. That's the Okanagan fish. So as they get further along in the river, then you would want to start running as the water warms up and the fish start to change color. It's more of a plug bite. What's so fun about that is this. You can fish below Wells Dam, and you can catch a lot of fish down there. You don't have to have a jet boat. Problem with it is, is there's 5,000 of your closest buddies there, and everybody's competing for one spot, which I just, I don't enjoy that. That's not fun for me. I, I want to go fishing. My goal is not to go out there and fill my freezer. My goal is to go out there and have fun, and I just don't have fun in that environment. You know, I fish down at the Rogue River, 300 guys in a 400-yard stretch, but they all knew what they were doing and it was effortless. When you get down there, you got a guy that just pulled his boat out and heard about it and go, he does, he's all over the, back trolling's not easy. It's, everything's opposite of what you think. It's like backing up your trailer. If you've never done it before, you're gonna be over here, then go over there. So it just turns into this big mass of chaos. What we do is we go up and we fish at the mouth of the Okanagan. You're trolling the Columbia, there's some current, it's like trolling a lake, man. You drop your stuff down, you gotta get out there at first light, 3.30 in the morning, we were catching fish in the dark. Okay, it's a first light bite thing. You can catch them all day. You just got to change some things. But you go up there, and guys, it's just enjoyable. You just kick around. You catch some good fish. It's fun, and not enough people go and do that. I don't like to generally encourage people, hey, go to my spot. But for salmon, because I know people love the salmon, go there and do it. Bob's Triangle Shell. If you, if you want to go down there, look it up. Triangle Shell there in Brewster. Get a hold of Bob, he'll tell you everything that's going on. He'll tell you if it's good or not. Don't bother, yeah, sure, whatever. It's simple to get to, it's fast, guys. You go to Banks Lake, you go to Electric City, instead of going down to Electric City and to Chief Joe, you just go up and over the hill and you drop right down into it. You come out right next to Chief Joe. It, you're like two hours away to some great salmon fishing, you know? And the thing that's nice about them, like the Ringgold fish, we go down there and do that. The nice thing about those summer and spring fish is that the table fare is just so much better in them. You know, if you fish down there in September in Ringgold, that's the best time. The first two or three weeks of September, the fish are bright, they're eating good, they're good to eat, and then they just start to get tired and tired and tired. They start looking like a tire. But do yourself a favor and go down there to Brewster. It is so simple. It's so much fun. You know, middle of the day, it's 120 degrees down there, but it's a lot of fun. You owe it to yourself to go do it if you enjoy salmon fishing. So close and so easy to do. You, know, just, you just follow the boats, just stroll right out in front of the Okanagan. It's simple as can be. Okay.